Okay, I think we're ready to start with the uh, Q&A part of the program. And once again, I'd like to thank April and Mike. It was an amazing production. Amazing. And Tom and you. Honestly, I think that was good. Get the extra time. We're going to open it up. I'll run the mic to anybody that's got a question, and uh, we'll go from there. Um, you all made the uh, other realms sound so interesting, and the whole out-of-body experience sound so attractive. And the question that formed in my mind as I listened was, we're we're here for a purpose. We incarnated for a purpose. How do we bring back any of the wisdom and the creativity and the um, goodwill that we may have experienced in these other realms to improve uh, the chances of our species surviving on this planet? <laughs> Your question has a couple of facets to it. You said, what can we bring back that's really useful to us? And I'd like to first get a kind of a, uh, we don't want to overstate okay, the value of the body as well as we don't want to understate it. It does have its value, but it's not necessary. Sometimes people have the idea that in order to um, in order to evolve their consciousness, in order to grow, this is a step. They should learn to go out of body. They should go places and see things. It's uh, you know, as Bill Bowman said, uh, you know, it's a great opportunity to have very meaningful spiritual experiences and so on. And they feel kind of like if they don't do that, they're left behind. They're not really doing what they should. It's not like that. You don't have to have a paranormal experience of any sort in order to grow the quality of your consciousness, in order to become spiritual. It's not a necessary step that needs to be taken. But it is a step that can give back value. And the way that it gives back value is the first thing it does is it puts you face to face, eyeball to eyeball with your own fear. And fear is the opposite of love. And what we're trying to become on the spiritual journey is love. So if we anything we can do that will help us deal with the fear and get rid of it is a good thing. And the outer body will do that. You will primarily find yourself there first. The fears that you have will materialize and you will have to deal with them as physical things as opposed to sweep them off under the rub rug in the back of your mind and ignore them. So that's one that's one advantage that you will get. The second is that you can, you can have an experience of meeting, saying hello to, being a part of the larger consciousness system. And there's probably many of you that have had this experience. It doesn't have to be in the context of an out-of-body or even a meditation state. It can happen in all sorts of other ways as well. But there's probably any number of you who have been in an altered state, whether you were praying or meditating or whatever is irrelevant, and you felt that present, that presence. You felt the love. You felt, you know, you saw the light. You moved toward the light, and suddenly you were overwhelmed with a sense of love and belonging and being attached to everything. That's a common experience. It's an experience you can easily have if you learn how to go out of body. Now, I'm just using out of body. Out of body is a funny term. You don't go out of body. It doesn't have anything to do with your body. It has to do with your consciousness. Okay? It's not leaving your body. The body isn't the key here. It's the mind. The consciousness is the key. But if you have that experience, as many do, it's a life-changing experience. You suddenly see the bigger picture. You feel the love. You're connected to everyone. And of all the people I've known who've experienced that, it's probably been many. None of them are the same afterwards. Suddenly they get it. Because it's not just an intellectual thought. It's not something that they read in a book or something they thought up. It's an experience. A real deep, down to the bone and sinew level experience of being one with all and being connected to that love. 
and that will change you. And that experience is available to you. It's just there. You can connect to that whenever you want. It's a big refresher, you know, if you're feeling if you're feeling down. So that's some of the things that you can bring back from this experience that help you grow up here. Is just seeing the bigger reality, being aware of it, being aware that you are more than your physical body, not because that's something you're supposed to believe, but because you've experienced it, and it's a fact of your experience. There's a big difference of knowing something from the intellectual level and knowing something at the being level. And there's nothing like experience to produce that knowing at the being level. So that's really the, the value of this. And I think that's what Bill Bowman was talking about. He says you can have some amazing spiritual experiences if that's what your intention is set on. It'll give you a sense of the larger reality and what it's all about. And it's, it's life changing. I, I feel like I didn't express my question very clearly because I wasn't consciously thinking so much of the individual um, and coming back as an individual and how I as an individual will be a, a different kind of person, but okay, I tend to think in pictures and I have to stop and try to keep the pictures. Um, I went to see a movie that was not a violent movie, and I was exposed to five coming attractions, four of which were doomsday, apocalyptic, brutal, over-sensory, overloaded. I felt pistol whipped by the time I saw the trailer for Much Ado About Nothing. I mean, um, and so that picture, I think, came up in my head because how are we supposed to, um, how can we, create a critical mass if we're only focused on a kind of cocoonish, well, um, I'm doing the best I can as an individual, is, you know, we live in such a contradictory world right now in terms of what's going on in the glorification of killing and other things. So I was thinking more communally. How, how do we find one another? The only way that we can improve ourselves collectively is to first improve ourselves individually. Exactly. That's the way. You cannot go out and change another person at the being level. They are as they are. They can only change themselves. And if you then make your mission to go out and help people change themselves, that generally doesn't work, you see. What you can change, though, is yourself. And if you focus on changing yourself, if you are successful in becoming more evolved in the level of your consciousness and becoming love, that will spread. You will change other people just because of how and who you are. And that's where we have the greatest leverage. It's not in changing other people. Changing ourselves and just being among other people. That's what will, that is the only way to change us collectively, is that we have to all change individually. So it's not going out and fixing other people. It's going inside and fixing ourselves. That's the, that's the key thing. There isn't other, any other way to do it. There's no magic way to uh, do things you know, that will fix other people. There is now, a role for community? In well, there is. You see, but I'm saying that forms up naturally. If we ourselves are growing up, let's say we ourselves become love, or at least move in that direction, then we start to demand you know, movies that don't scare us in the, in the advertisements. We don't, you know, we, markets start to change. As we as individuals change and become more enlightened, then so will our CEOs and so will our government people and so will everybody else. The whole thing grows up together. The social aspect of it is made up of individuals. The social part doesn't live apart from the individuals. What you see out there that's ugly when you turn on the news and watch the trailers and so on, that's us. That's the way we are. That ugly picture is a very accurate representation of us collectively. We create that reality and we have to live in it. That's part of our feedback. The only way to change it is to change ourselves. So socially, you don't go out and try to change a social thing. You change the social thing from inside at the individual level. The only place you have leverage to make that change is change yourself. So you're not really putting yourself in an isolated cocoon when you're changing yourself and you're letting society go to hell in a handbasket. It's not like that. 
we all need to change ourselves. And that's the only path that's going to work. Because as you go out there and try to push the society one way or another by enacting laws, you can't have trailers that scare you. You know, and we do that. All we do is create more problems when we try to use our our uh, force or our power to make other people be the way we think they ought to be. It's not a good way to approach it. I kind of said what I was going to say, but uh, the ego will tell us that we are separate. This is a unity perspective. We cannot be separate, and it is only our ego that is telling us that we are not making a difference on a global uh, level. When we are doing it individually, we cannot help but raise the vibration that is the collective whole of human consciousness. It's a byproduct. You cannot separate it, so you cannot be uh, going away doing something from a selfish standpoint, because when you are in that place of holding a higher reality, a deeper reality, a more beautiful, peaceful, loving reality, the possibility that reality exists for all, for everyone. And uh, unity is all about choice. This is what we teach. And at that moment of seeing those trailers, I have a choice to add to the collective good of the consciousness of humanity or to take away. To resist that which is happening on the screen and call it bad and wrong or terrible, to get up and walk out, or to simply be the presence of love in the midst of whatever's happening on the screen. Because really that's what we teach, is what's happening on the screen, this is all, this human world is the movie that we have created. We can change it. We can change the screen, the film at any moment. And so whether it be in a movie theater, or it be the movie theater of our existence, we are affecting the reality of the whole to a beautiful and wonderful degree. The more awake we are, the more loving we are, and the more peaceful we are. All right, before the next question, someone asked me to reintroduce the panel now that you can see, because before they were in the back and kind of scattered. So starting from the left, we have Reverend Richard Burdick. Uh, that's our, our spiritual leader who I believe operates in several realities at once. <laughs> uh, and then to his right, we have our, our dear Reverend Carol, who basically that she's the reason we're in this building, and we bless her and love you every time you're here. And then we have Tom Campbell, uh, author of My Big Toe, physicist and metaphysicist. And it just gets better every time you hear Tom. Um, and then next to Tom on his right is Dr. Pamela Knight, uh, Tom's wife. And it's, again, it's a joy to have you here. <coughs> and then next to uh, Dr. Knight, we have April Hanna, the director, producer of the movie. Producer, got that right. And then to her right, we have Mike Habernick, and he is the director. Okay, next question. I just would like to know, are our dreams in any way, on any level, related to what you're talking about? Yes. <laughs> That's the short answer. Yes, they are. The dream reality is just another reality system. It's no more real or less real than what we call physical reality. It's just a different reality system. This physical reality is actually a virtual reality, and so is the dream reality. Just information. It's just we don't go through our body senses, we just get it into our mind. So we short circuit the body with that data stream. But yes, it's a, it's a perfectly um, valid reality frame in which you can learn. You can learn things in that dream reality. It's not just all entertainment. I mean, sometimes it's just repetitiveness, and sometimes it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But most of the time, you can actually find meaning in it. You can find the same thing that, that uh, Bill said in the movie. He talked about he went out, and there's a staircase went up, the staircase went down, and he met this big monster, and the monster was his own fear. Many people do that very same thing in the dream reality. They run into things, and mostly it's their own fear. And if they would stand and face it, they would find that that fearsome thing is just a paper tiger. It's not really so terrible. So yes, dream reality is another reality frame. And an interesting thing there is that there is no preferred or real reality. It's like, well, this is the real reality, and the dream reality is the fake reality. It's not like that at all. Whichever reality you are focused in, you're aware in, that's the one that feels and seems physical. When you're in the dream reality, the dream seems 
physical, and this reality is gone. This reality is non-physical. When you're in this reality, it seems physical, and the dream seems not physical. So we talk about physical and non-physical, and really, there isn't any difference. You could call them all physical or all non-physical. It doesn't matter. It's just whether it's physical or non-physical is just a perspective of the observer. So the dream reality is just as authentic a reality as this. It's just a different one for different reasons and different purposes. Thank you. Uh, I've been around a while, and i got to tell you, in over 80 years, it doesn't look to me like things are getting better. As a matter of fact, just in the last decade or two, it seemed like things were getting better at a faster rate. And uh, so, from, from an individual standpoint, coming back and having this loving experience, uh, I, I can't see that it's had much of an overall effect on the world situation. Let me play with that one. <laughs> I think the importance of a documentary like this is it shows us that there are that we're all we are all one. It shows us that there are there are many aspects of life and life is a perception. And to be able to see the many levels of reality, as Tom says, and recognize that it's all the same. We've been teaching in unity for so many years about our oneness. And intellectually, we all get that. We do. We get, oh, yeah, we're one. We're all God. It's all great. But deep down in our true gut and our experience, it's still something out there. It's like, yeah, well, it sounds good. It sounds wonderful. And so then we look at all of the things that are happening in the world, and we use them as our reason for saying, look, the world is really bad. Look at all the terrible things that are happening. And intention, I, I got so much out of that whole point, is that your intention is really what's the most important part of you. What are you intending? Well, when we look at what's wrong in the world, then our intention becomes very focused on what's wrong. And because we're all connected, because there's only one of us in this room, when we set our intention and we focus on that, we become part of the problem. We're not broken. We're not broken. We don't need fixing. But as Tom said, individually, we are amazingly powerfully creative. And individually, we have a choice. And we're sitting in that choice 24 hours a day, even when we're sleeping. Because even when we go into the sleep state, a lot of our fears that we take into the sleep state, sleep state is what occurs in our dreams. And so it's so critical for each of us individually to say, what's the drum I'm beating right now? You know, what's the story that I'm telling right now? And how can I come to that place of seeing the world in all of its magnificence instead of seeing all the world and its problems. And as far as violent movies go and violent stories and things like that, yeah, it's pretty amazing. And yet, if we decide that that's bad and that's wrong and the children that are growing up on the video games and Halo and all these violent things that they're going to be destroyed, if that is where our focus is, then that's what we're going to get. So I just, I just believe so strongly that on every level of our life, it's up to us to decide how we want to see it and what drum we want to be and how we want to be the difference that we want to see in the world and, and see the good in it and focus on the good instead of worrying about the things that are happening in the world that we don't agree with. I wanted to make a comment too. You may be right, you're older than me, you've seen more than I have, so in your 80 years maybe you've noticed that things have gotten worse, but I think some of that is a perception as well, in that 
with the media now is just, I mean, everywhere, in the, into every aspect of your life. And unfortunately, what evidently seems to pay is sensationalism. So that what we hear about in the media all the time is all the horrible, bad things going on. But there's a lot of wonderfully good things going on, too. That just doesn't make the news. Yeah, I, I, watching. I don't know which outweighs the other. That I do not have the answer to that, but there's some great stuff going on. This church has lived this in the last four weeks with the issue over the scouts. The media has made a big deal of going after Johnson Ferry Baptist and Roswell Street Baptist because it sells news. And very little has been paid attention to in regards to the good, the outpicturing, that out of the Baptist churches in this area and all the denominations in this area, Boy Scouts are universally being accepted for lifestyles of choice. And because two big churches made a decision to release their Boy Scout support, that's what we're hearing about. And the reality is it's a very small, minute amount of energy um, in the grand scope of acceptance that is happening to a great degree. And I'll leave you with a comment that I leave every piano student I've ever worked with. They'll play a piece and they'll make three or four, five mistakes. And they'll beat themselves up. And I tell them, go back and count the right notes. And every single time a student has been able to count the right notes, their skill as a musician, as a spiritual musician, has increased to a great degree. Let us all continue to count the right notes. Just one other um, addition to that, really it's saying the same thing. It's already been said three times, but saying it a little differently. And that is, we have, you know, life is, is very simply described as stuff happens and we get to deal with it. That's life. Okay. Now, when you look out there and you see all the ugly stuff that's happening, you think, wow, this is really bad, you know, things are deteriorating and so on. But the key is that the stuff that's happening is really not where the action is. That's not where the growth comes from. What's important is how we deal with it. You see, that's where you grow, that's where you learn. So it doesn't really matter too much about the stuff happening. It's how we, the decisions we make, the choices we make, and how do we deal with that stuff. So you see things that distress you, it's how do you deal with those things? How can you deal with them in a way that's helpful to all those around you? Well, if you complain and fuss and are negative about it, then you're part of the problem. You're not part of the solution, you see? That's the wrong choice. If the things happen that you don't like, you need to find ways to make choices that are part of the solution, that are your growth and others' growth, that are most helpful to the people around you. And sometimes the things you just can't affect, right? I mean, there are things that are so much bigger than you are. Well, still, you have, you can always choose whether you're going to get upset or be angry or whether you're going to write a letter to your congressman or whether you're going to, you know, shrug and walk away or how are you going to do it? What are you going to order? What are you going to change in your life to make sure that you're not adding to the same problem? So I say we don't really, if we analyze the stuff that happens, we may get disheartened and feel discouraged, but that's not where the real action is for us. It's in the, how do we deal with it? That's where we learn, that's where we grow. That's our potential for growing up and becoming a lot, is how we deal with it. And the potential is always there, and bright, and huge, and available to us. We just have to make the right choices. So don't, let's not get discouraged about what's happening. Let's figure out how we can make the right choices, to deal with it in a way that makes us part of the solution. I have the mic, so I'm, I'm up now. <laughs> uh, I find it fascinating the, uh, the out-of-body experiences can help you face your fears. Uh, it seems to be a strong aspect of when people have that. Because I had one experience when I was in college in a dorm and uh, I made it up to the ceiling and I never went, you know, I, what, I found myself back in my body and then I was just, just freaked out and I never did it again, but, um, or at least consciously. But um, t two questions. One, uh, you were talking about how you face your fears 
and how that one situation where they, um, that, dog, that dog being just melted in it was the fear. But I'm a little confused on, is there other, like they talk about aliens and entities and if you go out and you're in another dimension um, and it, you can control everything by intent, but can they, if, is it just a figment of your imagination, these entities, or is it, are they actual real? Can they, can, you know, can you just by intent bring you back to your body? Or um, are you being abducted and, they, and you can't just by your intent come back to your body? I mean, is there any information on there? Is there a difference between that type of entity or a fearful energy that you're facing your fear? Is there any distinction between that one's, you know, uh, is your, in your mind? Is, and, and my second question, too, the follow up, just to be thinking about it, kind of goes hand in hand. Has anybody ever got stuck in another dimension and never got back? <laughs> by it. 
And that trauma that you experience could alter, you know, the rest of your life. Now you may not be able to sleep without a light on. Now you might, you know, jump when, when uh, you see things in the dark. That's just you know, the wind blowing the bushes. It may change you in a way that's not helpful. So yes, you can be hurt there, but it's only through your own fear is the mechanism by which you're going to be to be hurt. So that's I hope I you know answered your question. Fear is the, Fear is the problem. So you have to get rid of your fear, and the other thing you really have to do if you want to experience these other realities is learn how to control that intent. See, most of us have an intent that sits still for about two seconds, and then it changes, and then it changes, and that intent's just flying all over the place, all the time. And if you have that kind of intent, you're gonna have that kind of an experience, and it won't make any sense to you, and it won't be very helpful. So you have to learn to get rid of all that noise in the, in the mind so that your intent can be steady and focused and you can hold that steady focus without it jumping around and then your intent becomes powerful. It changes things. Do you have documentation or evidence or experiences with, with people you can aware of doing this that um, you brought negative entities back with you from the out of body experiences and so you got over that fear there was going to be around. Yeah, that's, that's only your fear. Only if you're fearful will you bring, bring anything back with you that is unpleasant. That's your, that's your fear. Right. So you may end up having your fear boosted and, and made bigger by a bad experience coming back and now you've got more fear than you had before you left. Right. That's why the system tends to not let that happen. So that you get to just what you did and something came up and said boo and you run away and you don't come back because you're not really ready for that yet. Because right. if you got there, it would be even worse. Right. So that's often what's what's happening. Lots of people have that sort of experience that you had. Sure, sure. Thank you. I had a question. What's the difference between like out of body experience and like lucid dreaming? The differences are really very shallow. There's no major difference between out-of-body, lucid dreaming, remote viewing. They're all first cousins. Okay? The, the main difference... This way? This way better? This way? No. The main difference is the attitude with which you arrive, the beliefs with which you arrive, the intention that you have, that's the big difference. The smaller difference is the process and the tools that you use. When you use an out-of-body, you never lose consciousness. You go from being conscious in this reality to conscious in another reality. You don't go to sleep first. In a lucid dream, you lose consciousness, then regain consciousness. Basically, that's just a different technique. But because people then have beliefs, they wait if they're going out of their body, they have this belief that they're actually their their consciousness lives inside their body and that it's going to, you know, slip out somehow. And where are they going to find themselves? Well, where else? In their room, right? There's their body. That's why people see their bodies and come out into their rooms because they have a belief that they're actually coming out of their body. They're not really coming out of their body. They see that because they believe it. When you lucid dream, you wake up and you find yourself in a dream. And now you're in this dream world and you kind of limit yourself to places you can go and things that you can do in the dream world. Why do you limit yourself? Because that's the way you believe it is. You see? So they come with their own tools, their own beliefs. When you remote view, you're looking at another place on earth, generally. You're trying to locate some set of coordinates somewhere and see what's going on there. You're remote viewing. Well, you could remote view in other reality frames. You have to remote view on the earth, but why do we only remote view different places on the earth? Because that's what remote viewers do. And when you get down to remote view, that's what your intent is. So that's what you do. And remote viewer would tell you that he doesn't do lucid dreaming and he can't go out of body, but he can do remote viewing. You see, it's all the beliefs and the intents and the tools. So are they different? Not really, in substance. They're all accessing information from the larger consciousness system based on their intent. And that's all the same. So the mechanism in the big picture, there's really not much difference, except kind of the details. But to the experiencer, they're hugely different because of the beliefs that 
and the, 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 that each person uses. I found that the third cousin, you mentioned lucid dreaming and how the body experiences being cousins, and from the unity perspective, this whole movie was about prayer and meditation. And we call it the silence. We don't call it an out-of-body experience, but it is the silence. And what was curious for me, and maybe perhaps you can answer this, Tom or anybody, um, the difference being in, in unity we teach the silence is almost the transcendence of the personality. So the ego no longer exists. It's almost as if the wave has become now one with the ocean, which is a very scary place and threatening to the ego. But in uh, the movie, there seemed to be consciousness that continued of yourself as a personality interacting in relationship. Um, so I found that that's where the unity perspective got off the, the boat as far as that particular experience. Um, is, are there moments in the out-of-body experience where you don't have this recollection of you as a person, as a personality, as an entity, as an ego, but the benefits come back, but you don't know where you've been. You just feel a sense of completeness or remote feeling where you everything that's ever been. And I was particularly excited about there is no time. There is no time or space, uh, the 25-year gap that was there. And this is something Unity teaches in God. Uh, in the oneness, there is no time and space. Can you talk a little bit about the difference between the two? Sure. Um, yes, we can. You're right. That is a, another cousin. You know, and I wouldn't even say that it's a, a distant, you know, or a third cousin. It's it's very very similar experience. It's not that different. So when you have these, you know, what's the difference between prayer and meditation? You know, mostly it's the beliefs that you bring, you know, to the process is the difference between them. Um, Oftentimes, what I, what I will tell people is, is learn to meditate, and the first thing that you should learn to do is hold the microphone. The <laughs> second thing you should learn to do is find a place called point consciousness. When you find a place called point consciousness, all that means is that you have let go of this input, this physical input from this particular reality frame. Okay, so you're no longer processing sense data. You're just a point of consciousness floating in the void. Now that doesn't mean that you're not aware that you're not that you're sitting in a chair. You may be aware that you're sitting in a chair, but you're not processing it. You're not dealing with it. It's just there in the irrelevant background that you're sitting in a chair. Well, that's not really very different from what you're describing. See, that's a that's a similar sort of thing. Well, when you get to this state, one thing you find is that it's a wonderful place to be. It's a lovely place to just hang out. And a lot of people will get to that state and just hang there, just experience it. And sometimes from that they will see the light and feel the love, and sometimes they feel the love without seeing the light. It doesn't matter. These are just visual metaphors that we, that we use. It's not that the light is really a light, it's just a metaphor that we use. But we have these feelings. Now when you're at that spot, you can just go there, experience it. It's like recharging your battery. You come back feeling whole. Right? This is kind of the experience that you have. You come back knowing that you're a piece of everything, and everything is a piece of you. It's a wonderful experience. But if you want to, when you're at that point of point consciousness, you're not processing any of the physical data. If you have a strong and focused intent, you can do anything else you want to, too. In other words, that's a good launch platform for all the rest of this stuff. Now, people ask me, well, you know, I get to point consciousness and I can stay there, but I, never, I can't get out of body. If you're point consciousness, you are out of your body. Yes, they're the same thing. You see? And a lucid dreamer is in a dream that he has control of. Well, you're in a dream that you have a control of. It's all basically the same thing. So there you are. You're in this state of point consciousness, which is the same state you're describing. And you decide you'd like to know what's going on in whatever place or so on. You'd like to remote view that. All you have to do is just hold in that area. When you're in that area, of course, you know you let your ego and, and intellect go. You're not an intellect. When you say you're not an intellect, that doesn't mean you're a rock 
and you can't think. It just means that you stop processing, judging, analyzing, you know, that kind of thing. You can use your intent then to go anywhere else you want. You are out of body. You just haven't then focused your intent to do anything else other than just sit in that point and soak up the good stuff that you find at that point. So yes, you can do any of these things. You already are out of body. There's no difference. But then also another thing you can do at that point, if you have a focused intent, you can heal someone. You not only can remote view, but you can use your mind to heal. It's just your intent. Intent modifies probable future. So by focusing your intent on something, you're modifying the probability of what the future is going to bring. And you know, that's a powerful thing. So it's a matter, though, of getting into that state with your mind blank, then taking your intent, focusing it, and holding it steady with that focus without it jumping all over around, without judging, without analyzing, am I really doing this, is it working? You know, you gotta let all that intellect stuff go. Just be at the being level. Your intent is focused out of your being level, not out of your intellect. And you're there, there is no difference. It's the same thing. So if you want to travel to other reality frames, you want to heal, you want a remote view, you're already there. You've gotten to the doorway already. Now all you have to do is focus your intent and walk through the door and just let it happen. And the way you do that is you just have to be open. Let's say you're gathering information. You want to, you want to you know, look at past lives or somebody that's passed on. You want to connect with them. You just have that intent. Open yourself and let happen what happens. If you have a preconceived notion of exactly what it's going to happen and how it's going to be like, you've just messed it up. You just open yourself and let it happen. And that's the way it is. And if you end up talking to somebody and the first time, you know, you interact with them and you say hello and they say hello and you're wondering, am I making this up? You know, if that's the first thing that comes to your mind, it's gone. You've lost it. You need to just be in the moment. Then you can return to that individual just by intending to be with them again, you see? And do that enough times. After you've done that 50 times and you've conversed and you've exchanged information, now you can make a good judgment. Is that real or is that not? But we don't, we don't do that usually. The first 10 seconds after we say hello to another consciousness, we immediately start judging our sanity and whether or not that's real or I'm making it up and that ruins the experience. So just have the experience. Be with it, go with it, open yourself up to it and do that over and over and over again and then make your judgment. You'll know then. If you ask the question too soon, you won't be able to answer it. You'll never be able to answer it. I have the microphone, sorry. <laughs> it's a hot commodity. <laughs> Um, for the filmmakers, I wanted to thank you for putting this yeah. together. This is amazing. Thank you for expanding our level of awareness of what's even possible in this amazing space that we live in. Um, I had an out-of-body experience when I was a small child. I was having surgery, and I remember leaving my body during the surgery procedure and being with my parents in the waiting room. And I could describe the whole process, and my mom was like, whoa! <laughs> And I didn't really know what it was until later on in life. So, and I loved the example that you brought up in the film of talking to the child who was having a bedwetting problem. And I thought, wow, if more parents understood a new approach to talking to their children, what an amazing gift we could give them. I wanted to know if you guys are going to make a follow-up film for children of how to talk to them <laughs> about these types of experiences. <laughs> Uh, he always does that. I always want him to talk and he passes it to me. Are we going to make a, a film on how to talk to children? That, that's actually a great idea. Maybe we will. But uh, what our plan is right now is for this to be a trilogy. We got very stuck in making this film, actually. We created it three times and scrapped all the footage three times. And the original intention was for this to be a four-part DVD series. It was going to be the afterlife, out of body. The third one was going to be dedicated to healing. And then the fourth one was going to be more of the evolution of consciousness and science. 
And I remember we're in the editing room, and Mike was just like, I just can't get past what the name of the third film should be. And I'm like, Mike, we're editing on the second film. Like, focus, focus. I don't care what the third one should be. You know? And he's like, no, I just can't get past it. So, like, we were really stuck in many areas. And then I don't remember what happened, but one day we were editing, and the thought came to us that what if this just became a trilogy? And I'm like, well, everything comes in threes, right? Your death, Father, Son, Holy Ghost, you know, this, that, the other. So I was like, you know, maybe that this should be a trilogy. And for something, something clicked for Mike that day. He was like, yes, the four, the third one's gone. All right, you know, we'll figure that out. But we were thinking we have so much footage on different techniques of healing. A lot of people, after they see these films, they ask, well, okay, tell us how to do it now. You know, what are the mechanics of it? We want to learn. And uh, I think each piece you'll see in the first film and this film, we always have a little bit that we throw in there about kids because I think that's one thing that we can all go back and remember. But um, the plan is for there to be a third film, uh, not yet started, or quite named, or we don't really know yet, we'll see. But then we might create a second trilogy all on healing, and then we might be able to do something with that with children. That would be fun. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Um, and then my other question is, um, how difficult is it to rendezvous with another person in having an out-of-body experience? So, like, for example, you know, I live in one part of the world and my friend may live in another part of the world and time zone differences mean I'm sleeping at a different time and, you know, do we need to meet up 25 years in the future or <laughs> how difficult is it to rendezvous with another person knowing that time and space reality is, is an illusion in our physical world? First of all, don't worry about the time and the space. That's irrelevant. If you meet up with the other person, how hard is it? It's not hard at all. It's real easy. If you can go to the point consciousness state and hold it, if you can get to this meditation state or this prayer state and hold that and then have the intent to meet with that person, it doesn't matter whether that person's asleep in the middle of work you know, dancing the jig, you know, it doesn't matter what they're doing. You will be able to communicate with that person. And you can have a, a very, you know, deep and meaningful experience and exchange information and so on. Just don't too quickly start analyzing and judging, did I make that up? Just do it. Do it for six months. And maybe you do this in six months 50 times. That's good. Then you can start thinking about it as you talk to your friend and see what they're doing and what's going on, then it'll start to come together and make sense to you, what you're getting, the things you're missing, the things you're getting. Experiment. This is an experimental thing. It's not following a prescription thing. It's doing it and experimenting with it. But it's not hard to do at all. It, a lot of people find it hard to get into the point consciousness state. So that first step might be your biggest one. And that's a matter of just practice, just letting all the physical thoughts, all the things going on in your mind, all the judging, all the planning, all that stuff go to where you just can get in that point consciousness state. But once you get there, it's a pretty easy thing to do. And your friend can do the same. You see, you are a multidimensional being. You're not just the you that you think of as you. So when you talk to your friend and your friend is busy, in their physical body, in the middle of work, you know, solving a problem or talking to other people or even standing up and giving a presentation. It's not like, well, I can't talk to her now, she's busy. Only this fragment of her that's here working in this reality frame is busy. That's a very small part of her. The rest of her is available whenever you're available. So don't worry about time and schedules and that sort of thing. Just do it. It, don't have to, it doesn't have to make sense. Right? If you understand the larger reality, it does make sense, but just to do it, it doesn't have to make sense. It's not important that you understand anything other than do it. You only, it's only as hard as learning to focus your intent and quiet your mind. But if you're just a portion of yourself here, and you meet up with someone else at another dimension or another level, do you still get that experience in Yes, you get that experience. You get the whole experience with that person. In other words, you're multidimensional. You can be working here in this 
physical reality doing things and be doing other things as well at the same time. You're not just one dimensional. You're multi-dimensional. You can be operating on many levels at the same time. All of us do. It's not like, oh, this is a magic trick I need to learn. We all operate on multiple levels all the time. We're all communicating with each other. We're all connected. We're on like a big net. It's like the, you know, the worldwide net. We're on a big net. All our consciousness are connected to every other consciousness. And not just the consciousness of the people we know, but every other consciousness is available to us. You see? Would I remember the conversation? Yeah. Would you remember it? Probably not. So I would never know. Probably not. You would not. You would not remember it now. It's also very possible that you would remember it. Um, I can give you an example. Sometimes I just decide um, that I want to experiment, and I've never done the scientific experiments that Tom has done. But one day I decided I wanted to experiment with a friend of mine, so I decided that I would send her a message and tell her that her blouse was, un she had a button unbuttoned at the top, you know, so that she could button her button. And, and I just, it was just an experiment to test to see, did she hear the message at all, which she might not have if she was real busy or whatever, maybe she wouldn't have, but if she was more, a little more open and aware, she's a pretty intuitive person. So I asked her the next day, I said, hey, did you get the feeling that you had a blouse, uh, a button that you needed to close on your shirt? And, you know, I figured she'd look down and see that it wasn't really, didn't really need to be closed, but that, she would have had that feeling. She said, no, but for some reason I did just unbutton the top of my shirt. <laughs> so she, she got a message from me. She felt it or sensed it, but didn't necessarily get what I was totally intending. So It's not always, you know, it's not your intellect that you're really doing this communication with. It's at a deeper level. So you don't, you're communicating being level to being level, not intellect to intellect. You may or may not be aware of it, but it's, it works just the same in either case, whether you're aware of it or not aware of it. Real quick, if I could reiterate something Tom said earlier in regards to this specific question, from a unity perspective, and I was wanting to get a pom-pom and say yay, yay, yay. I believe that the human mind, unity teaches that the human mind, if we go into the experience with an attachment of what it's going to look like, what it's going to feel like, what it's going to taste like, we have blocked the ability to get there. So a concern or worry about, is she going to remember? Is she going to know? Is it going to feel this way? Is it going to be something that's going to be a certain way? We've already blocked the process and the experience from happening. And I believe you said earlier, let go of any attachment, become very Buddhist, any attachment to how it's going to play out and just do it. So something I've heard a lot is that uh, if you hang out with an enlightened being, it can really speed up and help one's own enlightenment. Uh, can you transfer some of what you said about you know, being with a friend, being with another person, to uh, being with an enlightened being? Uh, because you know, on this plane, that can logistically be tough. There can be hard to find, and so forth. Uh, uh, <laughs> yes, I can. I can tell you a little, a little bit about that. We're, we're all netted. Okay? We're all connected with each other. We're all sharing data all the time at this, at this being level. It's not at the intellectual level, but it's at the being level. That's why we have mob behavior. Right? You, you'll have a mob of people, and they will degenerate down to the lowest common denominator, the people in the mob, because they're angry, they're upset, you know, they're, whatever it is they're, they're doing. They become the mob, and they pull each other down, so to speak you can have the opposite effect of being in the company of people who are enlightened. I hate to use that word, you know, that's an overused word, but people who have a high quality to their consciousness, people who are a lot of love at the, at the being level. And if you are around people like that, they will tend to pull you up. It's kind of the antithesis of the mob. And that's because we're all netted. And if you're with a lot of people who aren't pulling you one way or the other, but still you kind of share their feelings. That's that's how uh, Jung got his archetypes. You know, these archetypes are, you know, they're individual, they're cultural, they're even species-wide. You know, human archetypes. 
We all share, we're all netted. Yes, you can pull each other up, you can pull each other down. That's why having a good friend is so important, because you tend to pull each other up. Not such a good friend, you pull each other down. Anyway, your, your other part is, should you then try to get around you know, the great guru, so that you stay in his shadow, it will pull you up. It will make you feel better, perhaps. You might walk with a lighter step, but it isn't going to help you grow up at all. That has to be done by making your own changes and choices from the inside. So you can hang around with, with the great guru or, or the, you know, the enlightened person all you like. You'll feel better. You may even act better in that kind of company because the whole thing feels lighter and higher and nicer and you're kind of lighter and higher and nicer too because you're sharing this, you know, we're communicating, we're communicating all the time, but it won't make you grow up any. You're not going to become a more spiritual person for that. As soon as the great guru goes off and you're by yourself, you're just yourself again. <laughs> it's not doing you any permanent good. So yes, we do pull each other up and down. Um, you do have the opposite to the to the mob, which is a lot of good good thoughts. And we know this. You know, a lot of people get together, old friends, and they just start talking, and everybody feels better and energized. It's because they're feeding each other on this being to being level, not on the intellectual level. But it doesn't change you. You have to change yourself by making good choices. So no, I wouldn't say. You should seek, seek out a, you know, a highly spiritual person to hang out with because that'll help you grow. It won't. It'll be fun. <laughs> but, you know, it's always nice to be around people like that. But uh, it won't be permanent. Uh, let me ask, uh, this phenomenon has been examined a great deal on a scientific level. Uh -huh. Have you given much attention to the subjects themselves? And I'm speaking of the people. Uh, for instance, uh, a Briggs-Meyer test, or perhaps a hierarchy as to you know where they fit in the family. No, I haven't done that. That doesn't mean it hasn't been done. Uh, we found that there's a couple, but there are a couple of personality traits that are important that makes it easier or makes it harder. The the way you have to come to this in order to find success is what I call open-minded skepticism. You have to be open-minded. If you're not open to the possibility, then it's not going to happen. Because if you come with the belief that this is impossible, it'll be impossible. So being open is an important part of it. Not being judgmental, not analyzing, just being and accepting what, what comes and dealing with that. So basically what you're saying is we, it is best if, if you're a scientist. Because scientists aren't supposed to come prejudging anything. They're supposed to just be open to the facts of what happens and see what happens and, you know, do, deal with the data rather than come in kind of knowing what the data is going to show. That's not good science. So that's one characteristic. The other characteristic is being skeptical. You'll do much better in this if you come to the process of, I don't know what's going to happen here, but I'm just going to try to find out. I'm just going to open myself to it. And six months from now, I'll start thinking about what actually happened. But I won't do it right away. So if you're not skeptical, you, you have a tendency to have you know, let your imagination run away with you. You begin to, you, you begin to uh, see and do and feel, and you start, uh, you start putting things into, into uh, perspectives that aren't necessarily you know, good, you know, they won't. They don't work out well for you. You're too ready to jump to a conclusion of what's going on and what does it mean. You're not just doing it and opening yourself. You know, you're not skeptical. You kind of it's, it's the same thing. You're bringing belief from the other side of the table to the to the brink. So it's people who are just open. Those are the people that that do it. Those people. I'm not sure where it would be with Myers Briggs. Uh, Pamela could tell you, but the people that uh, are very focused on analyzing everything. Very detail conscious that every little piece has to be analyzed. They have a very hard time mm -hmm. because they have a hard time just letting it be. You see? So there are personality types that have a problem. 
Um, it's not just a matter of you coming with beliefs that get in the way. You need to have a personality that can just accept, open up, and experience with no preconceived notions, like you're saying. If you if you think it's got to be this way, you've just ruined the possibility of the experiment. If you put certain demands on the data that it has to show this or has to show that, you've ruined the experiment. There's lots of people who can't get past the question, is it real? I was one of those for a long time. Eventually, you have to get by that, and you get by it with evidence. It's just you have to it takes some time for us left brainers to relax sometimes. You know, but yeah, it's open to everybody, but some people are more natural to it than others. Yeah, this is for Tom. You've mentioned many times that the term a higher system of consciousness. Yeah, larger system of consciousness. I can't remember what it was, but I remember it was there there. And what that feels like to me as I hear it anyway, is that there's something bigger than all of us that is even deciding if there's going to be a wall or not a wall, or we need to have this experience or that experience. And I'm interested in the concept of free will that we have in this higher, or not higher, I'm sorry, I'm sure you wouldn't use that hierarchy, but greater system of consciousness. First of all, free will. You have to have free will to have consciousness. Without free will, there is no consciousness. People are just going through the motions, right? They're just they're just acting out a script without without con no, no need for consciousness. Okay, so consciousness requires free will, and free will requires consciousness. There's nothing to be free if there isn't any consciousness. So these two are a logical match set, if you will, like the head and the tails of a coin. You can't have a dime with only heads. You, know, you have two sides. I guess you could have a dime with only heads, but you know what I mean. You always get two sides to the coin. One side comes as a logical consequence of the other side. Um, so free will is not the way we typically imagine it. Free will is simply the freedom to make a choice among the choices that you know you have. Okay. I call those choices that you know you have your decision space. So there's some choice that comes to you of how you can act or respond to something. And you may know of 10 different ways that you can respond to that. Actually, there's probably 30 different ways for you to respond to that, but you only know 10 of them because the other ones are outside of your beliefs. So you, know, you, you lose those. But out of those 10 that you know of, you get to choose which one you're, how are you going to respond? You're going to respond with love or with anger or with contempt or what? You can choose that. That's up to you. You have the free will to make that choice. So that's all free will is. The, the freedom to choose from among the possibilities that you're aware of. Okay, now we have this larger consciousness system. That's the big consciousness system of which we are a part. It's not a different system that's separate from us. It's, a, it's what we are. You know, it's like, you know, we talk a system, how about a system of my body, you know, and I say, well, here's my left hand. Well, that's a part of my body. It's different, has a different function. You know, it does different kinds of things than, say, my feet or my heart, you know, or, you know, my hair or my toenails or anything. It's different, but it's still a part of the system. Well, that's the way we are. We're a part of this larger consciousness system, but we have our own things that we do and our own reasons for doing it, but we're a part of it. And it's us and we're it. That's the, we're all one. We really are all one. Okay, this system is an evolving system. It's not a static, perfect, infinite system. It's a real, finite, evolving system, imperfect. Okay, so it's just a natural system. It's an information system. That's the larger consciousness system. Now, it needs to evolve. How does it evolve? Well, I talk in, in physical, in science terms, I say it evolves by lowering its entropy, right? Well, that's the same thing as becoming love. It's all the same sort of thing. And we are part of its strategy for that evolution. Okay, so we're, you know, we're at work growing up here. That's what we do. 
is we become love. And as we become love, we're reducing the entropy of ourselves and because we're a part of the system, of the whole system. So we're a part of the larger consciousness system's uh, process or uh, mechanism for evolving itself. Well, you either evolve or die. If you get to the point where you're not growing, you're, you're decaying. You can't stay in the middle. You're either growing, and we know that personally. If we get to the point where we just quit growing, that's the beginning of when we start going the other way. We start to fall apart. We start to disintegrate. So it's evolving. Evolving is an open-ended thing. And because we're part of its process, of course it would like us to be successful. Because it would like us to be successful, it gives us this nice physical universe to play in so that we can have choices with our free will to help us grow up. So yes, it would be helpful to us. It might jump out and go boo and look like a monster just because we're not ready to go into the larger system yet and experience because we have too much fear. So there it is helping us out. Um, it may just manipulate the right thing to happen to us at the right time called synchronicity. Things just work out that you get just what you need right when you need it. Well, that's, you know, the larger consciousness system is <laughs> helping us succeed. So our success is its success. If we lower our entropy, if we grow up and become more spiritual, more loved, it grows up some as well. So sure, it's a system that, that is, uh, wants to help us however it can, but it can't help us by doing it for us, obviously. Where's the growth in that? You see, there is no growth. We have to do it ourselves. So it can't really reach in and fiddle with what's going on heavy-handedly. It all has to be back in the uncertainty of events. So there is an interaction. There is a larger consciousness system. We are a part of it, and it is helpful to us. We're a piece of it. So, it's almost sounding like we're, you know, it's uh, religious, doesn't it? Yeah. It starts to, it starts to larger consciousness sounds like God, doesn't it? Yeah. So if it's, you know, but there's no dogma involved in it. It's just a natural growing system. So that's kind of the way I think of it. But there is this interaction. But it's not God, the little old man with the long white beard playing with these pet people. You know, it's not that kind of an image. It's totally different. I wanted to bring two remarks to add on to uh, some of the conversation. The conversation about children and whether or not you move forward in that area, I think one of the best things I was taught by one of my mentors she said, when the baby first starts to walk, everybody pulls out the cameras and applauds. It doesn't matter how many times they fall down. No one calls their mother or mother-in-law and goes, oh my God, my child will never walk. Took two steps and that's it. She can't make it any farther. We applaud the next attempt. And yet somewhere along the line in our maturation process, we stop applauding our attempts and we start cataloging them as failures. And that stops our willingness to grow because we feel vulnerable and we feel, you know, others will judge us. So part of the process side is, if I'm interpreting the conversation effectively, is the willingness to go ahead and fail at it. That you have to practice forward. You have to count what parts were working, as Richard was saying about learning to play a piano. It's not how many wrong, but how many right. You know, how much further along do we get this time than last time? Um, I think one of the other things that echoed for me is um, I'm a poet, and I wrote a poem for which the last two lines read, first you must understand that only you hold the key to your destiny, but you must daily unlock the door and walk through. It isn't sufficient to have the key. And it's not sufficient just to unlock the door. You have to be brave enough to leave yesterday behind and be willing to venture into the unknown. I guess that's why I'm a Star Trek fan. Um, <laughs> so, I think if we were to walk away with 
um, a closing thought. I think, I'm not saying we're closing at this time, but I would like to hear from each of you how you think that we can take to these experience and find it to enhance our own understanding. Is there one thought you'd like us to walk away with that could be beneficial or that could help us to um, grasp the ideas better? Boy, I don't know. Um, what was the first question? <laughs> From your experience of your participation in the development in the development of this, what did you walk away from that you think is your greatest share? Okay. Um, like making the films, I think what I wanted people to take away from, even if they just saw 30 seconds of the trailer of it, was that there's more to this physical world than we've been led on to believe. That's pretty much it. Um, there's also a, a saying that I heard through the works of Abraham, if anyone's familiar with that. And it's, you'll never get it wrong and you'll never get it done. So that's kind of been, I think, a powerful thing to hear because, you know, even in the workings of this film, I know Mike and I, we can sit back there and watch it over and over again. I can already think about five things that I'd like to change. <laughs> but we didn't get it wrong. You know, you'll never get it done, but we're gonna to work towards the next thing. And I kind of, that's been a really helpful thing. Um, just for me personally, like you said, when you kind of come up against things, you have the key, it's like no matter what you do, or if you're afraid to try out a body or go out of body, you know, you're not gonna get it wrong. And we always have work to do, so. Um, I guess my takeaway or share is kind of the motto that I live by, which actually came from him. Um, when I was pregnant with the first child that we had, and I tend to be a bit of a perfectionist, okay, so I have to do everything and do it well. So I'm reading every child uh, development book I can find. And he said, you don't really need to do all of that, just get your own head on straight. And that's been my motto ever since. It's all about working on my spiritual growth and development, and the better I am, the better mother I am, the better grandmother now I am. If, uh, I don't know, I could probably spot off one line or slaw the rest of the evening, but uh, I have to you know, get a, a couple of them. I, I would say that uh, uh, I agree with you know, what, you, what you said with your analysis, and too many of us use this, this strategy to deal with life, and that is that if I don't play, I can't lose. And, of course, that's wrong. It's not about not losing. It's about winning. And by that I mean it's about growing. It's about changing. It's about becoming. It's about love. And if you don't play, you will lose because you're not winning. So we, we tend to face things that way, that we kind of stay away from things that we're afraid that we might lose and not do well. Okay. Another uh, kind of little one-liner that I, that I like that you touched on, and that is that if it's not your experience, it's not your truth. You have to live according to your own truth. You can't live according to what you read in the book or what somebody else tells you. You have to live out of your own truth or you won't even know who you are. And if you don't know who you are, you can't grow up and can't change. You're trying to live at somebody else's truth won't work for you. It has to be your experience to be your truth. That's the, you know, those kind of couple of seminal ideas, and they all lead up to the one thing I already said. If I were talking to children and I wanted to make it simple, I'd give them that little thing that I said, you know, there's, there's two ends to this. There's all the stuff that will ever happen to you, and then there's the choices you have to how to deal with it. What happens to you is where you tend to focus and put all of your you know, all of your intent and all of your energy into manipulating the things that happen to you to be the way you want, but there's no profit in it. All the profit is in how do you deal with it. So just accept what happens to you and try to think how you can deal with it in a way 
that's positive for you. And if you just do that, the rest of your life will probably work out just fine. Thank you. The takeaway for me from today that I would hope that we would all get at some level is that we are so much more than we ever knew we were. We didn't grow up knowing that we were part of a larger intelligence, or as Abraham says, a greater dimension of who we are is in the non-physical. We didn't grow up learning that for the most part. So to understand that at a deeper level, where we step into it every day, we show up differently because we recognize that there's so much more potential. I, I, I just recently watched a, a, a DVD on a, a guru that uh, Greg Raduka gave me, and, and he said that we are the agent of God's potentiality. The agent of God's potentiality. Well, that's what this larger intelligence that we are part of, that we live and move and breathe and have our being in, that's who we really are. And to understand that and to move into life and make decisions and choices based on that knowing, even if we haven't gotten it at an experiential level yet, but still to make a choice based on that knowing and then see what happens. And then as we see things begin to turn around in our life and we realize that we are these powerful creative beings then every manifestation that comes about leads us into a deeper awareness of who we really are, an agent of God's potentiality. So many takeaways from the experience today in the movie. I'm going to just highlight three very quick ones through the filter of Unity's primary textbook, and that is the Bible. Master teacher first said, one must become like a child to enter the kingdom of heaven. And I believe there's a sense of vulnerability, humility, and willingness that uh, we all need to develop that of a child that perhaps we have lost and forgotten. The second was, in my kingdom there are many mansions. And I believe this is just taking his teachings and putting it through a scientific filter, but it is the same thing. There are many, many dimensions of this open up. And the third, and perhaps the most profound for me in watching the movie, um, would be through the, the scripture that says, where two or more are gathered in my name, I am in the midst of them. And what I was profound for me was a sense of community amongst the filmmakers, the brilliant minds, those who had experienced it, those that were historians. There was a sense of community. They were surrounded by people who had a belief in the possibility. They surrounded them, they found each other, they were magnetized and drawn to each other very intentionally. And I would say, if I'm to take away one thing, and one instruction for this gathering of people is surround yourself with people who believe in the possibility. Because where there are two or more gathered in that possibility, it is made manifest. I have a question. Um, it's kind of two parts. It's something you haven't really talked about. Sorry. <laughs> um, first, just saying thank you for talking about the system because that explains like the first. I've been dabbling. I've been practicing this stuff a lot in the last two or three years and having a good time. And sometimes not so good, but the first three to four months can be rather frightening. So that was really helpful to hear your explanation of the system. But my question is um, something that you didn't talk about really is I have a couple of different kinds of experiences in that um, sometimes it's more like how I hear you talk about going out and meeting people and um, having those conversations and that sort of thing, which always is happening, but sometimes it's more like we have bodies here and, and our consciousness here active. Sometimes it's more like stepping in and sharing in the consciousness of another reality in which I also exist and I'm experiencing. So sometimes it's a little bit out of context and it's interesting because you're learning the players and the names and what's going on there because you're not there most of the time. So it's like I step in and share space with this other me, right? But I didn't hear you talk about that. If you have anything to talk about with that, I would love to hear. And I think that's also because of the way that I link up and that I um, move my consciousness, sometimes it's, often it's very surreal. So the focal point is whatever's important to me, you know, comes back and is, and is 
more focused in less of a physical concrete seeing. Sometimes it's very vivid and very crystal is here, touching, whatever, but sometimes it's also very surreal. And I think it is kind of because of the way I bounce between the realities and dimensions to, to be. If you have any tools for crystallizing or um, clarifying the um, a more, I don't want to say dense, but more crystal, like I like it when it's more vivid and popping and crystal sometimes. I'd like to focus on that. And again, your comments on the transitioning from one reality to another. It's body to body sort of thing, sharing. All of those things that you experience are all there to experience. And what you experience depends mostly on what you need to experience to grow. You have those experiences that you're ready for. You don't have the ones you're not ready for. Uh, when you're, usually the first thing you do is you kind of fly solo for a while, and that's probably what you did in the beginning. Eventually you outgrow that, and you also need to interact as a, as a member. You know, you jump into other reality frames where you're one of the, you know, one of the players, and interact that way. And that's because you've gotten to the point where that kind of interaction is something you can learn from. It, it opens up your reality to another dimension of experience. That's why that happens to you. You should be open, and these aren't the only changes you'll get. It will change again and again and again. As you grow, the whole experience will change its character. As far as the clarity goes, you should not try to force clarity onto something that comes to you fuzzy. That's forcing it to be the way you want it. See, that's not really a good idea. Sometimes what you get has to come not at the detail level, but at the paragraph level. You get a whole lump of stuff that you can sense and feel, and it's meaningful to you, but you can't really sort it out, and it would be terribly difficult, if not impossible, to explain it to somebody else. Sometimes you have to accept information at that level. And as you accept it at that level, what you'll find is you'll get better and better at interpreting it. You'll get more and more out of it. You're really learning another language. But we have a tendency to want to force everything into the formats that we're familiar with. So when you get that, just relax with it. In other words, if that's what comes to you, accept it that way, deal with it, get out of it what you can. And if it turns out that what you're doing is suboptimal, you'll get a nudge to change to make it more optimal. In other words, you don't have to feel like you're in control of the process. It's not like, I'm not there, I'm not getting what I want. I need. How do I control this to get it the way I want it? The whole concept of control is looking at it from the wrong direction. It's open yourself up. Be a part of it. Connect with it and get whatever you get. Right. You just have to let your way will will develop in front of your feet one step at a time, and it will always change. So don't get too uh, wound up about any details or um, whatever. Um, always be open. Make no you know have no beliefs or expectations, and just let it all come as it comes. And if it's useful to you, then do more. Yes, it always is. Right. As long as you approach it that way, it'll always be useful to you. As soon as you approach it by wanting to control it, it'll be less useful to you. So one, this is promised the final question. This man gentleman has been so patient waiting for that <laughs> microphone, so I want to be respectful and give you the one last question, and can you do it in, in wow. two minutes? This is, should be pretty quick, and probably for Dr. Campbell. Uh, in regard to the heavy sync recordings, I've tried several, I've worked with several, and uh, I think they are, 10 or 15 years old. Um, I don't know if that, does that make a difference? Has the technology involved uh, of the, the actual beat frequencies that you're getting, has that changed or been refined more? Are there more recent discs that are in some way more effective? 
Uh, I think one of the first ones I heard was, uh, it sounded like a lot of uh, pink noise, white noise, and there was certain frequencies you could hear, actually, and then others that I think we were embedded. And another uh, disc that I used was, uh, it's kind of like uh, New Agey type music, and I think that the, the beats were embedded in that. You weren't really aware of it. Um, is there anything new? And is there anything you might recommend? You know, you're probably commercially not supposed to take sides or anything. But there's always something new. No matter what the subject is, you know, there's always something new. Uh, how useful it may be to you probably depends more on you than on the something new thing that you might try. In other words, you bring more to the table to your eventual success with it than the actual technology itself. It's not that the technology is going to drive you into one state or another as much as you're going to cooperate with the technology and let it take you someplace, you see? So there's a big personal component to your experience. So you want to know what can you do that will give you the greatest probability of success. And it has more to do with you than with the technology is what I'm telling you. Um, some technologies might just resonate with you and boy are they good and they may leave somebody else totally cold. It wouldn't work. So this idea of, well, did it work for you? Well, that might be helpful, but it might not either. So I would say that the, the active ingredient in this is the binaural beat. You know, in the fundamental active ingredients, the binaural beat. The rest of it tends to be added added things. Some of these added things are valuable, but some are not. They tend to be more individual with people. And I've just heard recently from somebody that said there was some new sounds and they're really great. And So yes, there are new sounds and they're really great, but no, I can't recommend any of them. I'm kind of past the point of, you know, binaural beats or sounds or that sort of thing and have been for a long time. So I don't really, I'm not up with that. So let me just give you some old technology advice. And not, this is not the new, latest, and greatest. But you can go back to basics. And instead of getting the most refined, nifty sound, just go to the web, Google binaural beats, and see what comes up. You'll get at least a several sites that will allow you to make your own binaural beats, however you want them. It's a site that allows you to create them. You'll end up with a mp3 thing that you can put on your iPod or you know just play off your computer or whatever into your headphones and you can determine what works for you best. I suggest that you experiment with it because again it's, it's individual. The things you have to pick are a bass frequency. Remember in the film he said you know 100 and 104 or 1000 and 1004. It doesn't matter. It can be 10,000 and 10,004 makes a little difference because what you're doing is trying to get into that theta, that hypnagogic state just before sleep, theta, and make both of your hemispheres synchronize at a theta state. It's really where you're going with it. So go to, the, go to the, that uh, site, find a bass frequency that you like, that feels good, that sort of resonates. You try different frequencies. I found that most males prefer a lower frequency. 100 hertz is a good one. That's a low kind of sound. Ladies like something a little higher than that, more like 500. Some people like one higher than that, like more like 5,000. It doesn't matter, but you take one frequency as the base, say 500, and the other one is 504, or 1,000 and 1,004, or 100 and 104. So that's how you pick your base frequencies. That'll give you a 4 hertz. And to be honest, it's not exactly four. You might get a little more out of about 3.875. <laughs> but four is close enough. Okay, so now what do you do? If you're just beginning, just hitting you with this four hertz may be a little disconcerting and you may never get, regain your balance. Some people will start by stepping it down. So they'll, they'll take a, a beat of, say, 100, and 110, that'll be a 10 beat. That's more like an alpha state, sort of a relaxed state. 
and they'll play that for two minutes, and then they'll switch it after two or three minutes to 100, not 107. And see what I mean? They'll step it down and, until the last one down will be the 100 and 104, and then they'll leave that on for a half an hour or 45 minutes, and then they'll start to step up. Then they'll go back to the 100 and 107 and 100 and 110 and 100, you know, and so on. Step you back up into the awake state. That way it takes you from beta, which is about 20, so you could start with 100 and 120, and all the way down to the theta state, and then all the way back up. It's not hard. It takes you about 15 minutes to put that together at one of these sites. The more experienced you get, those ramps up and down just get in the way. And then you'll just drop the ramp. You'll just start off and it won't make any difference. Then, after a while, you'll just drop the binaural beat at all because that won't make any difference either. These are all just tools that you're learning. They're like training wheels on a bike. They help the beginner get to where, get to that focus spot. Once you've been to that focus spot and back a hundred times, it's easier to get there again on your own without the training wheels. So I'd say eventually you have to know when to let go and just do it on your own. Same with meditation. Start with meditation. Eventually you outgrow meditation. You don't need meditation. You don't need your mantra. You don't need to do relax. You don't need to do anything else. You can be standing on one foot in the back of a bus and you can go to another reality frame just like that. You can heal. You can go to the point consciousness state and it doesn't really matter whether the incense is burning, you know, or whether or not, you know, the room is quiet, whether you've done your, you know, whether you've relaxed your feet first, you know, it just doesn't matter anymore. So these are all tools that help beginners start. So that's what I'd suggest. And pick a frequency. Now, if that doesn't work with it for, I'd say, at least three months, at least three months before you change it, you won't know any sooner than three months whether the sound works for you or not. If you dial up a sound and you've made one and you've got your M3P and you listen to it and you say, oh, that didn't do anything for me, so you get a different one. Well, that didn't do anything for me. You're wasting your time. You can't tell the first time you listen to it. This is a, it's a slow process. Listen to it for three months. Then change it. Say, okay, I'm going to make my, my ramp faster. I'm going to go at 3.875 this time. I'm going to make that a little longer. I'm going to do that for an hour or maybe I'll do it shorter. I'll change it a little bit. I want to move my bass frequency. That 100 was too low. It felt kind of growly to me. I want to up at maybe 800. Sounds good. We'll do it at 800. Work with that for three months. So you see now, if we keep doing this, it's going to take a long time. But in two or three or four years, you will really have something that works for you really, really well, probably better than anything that you could go out and commercially buy because it's custom fit and tuned to you. That's the good news. The bad news is that by the time you get there, you're a different person. <laughs> you need you either you either don't need it or you need to start over because you've changed and the things that resonate with you aren't the same anymore. So this is a continuously a continuous learning process. That's what you said the last time you were. So you know I'm going to be a new person if this continues much longer because I'm I've been here since 7:30 and I need to go home physically. I want to thank uh, everyone who's been on this panel for the incredible. Uh, See more of these kinds of things happening in Union North. Have a wonderful, wonderful evening.